Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. In 2016, Matt was a 185-pound, health-conscious personal trainer. He had just met his future fiance, and he was filled with hopes and dreams for a great future. However, his life was suddenly interrupted by a devastating diagnosis of stage 3C testicular cancer. Matt would undergo chemotherapy and a series of five major surgeries due to complications of his cancer. His disease and treatments took a tremendous toll on his body, reducing his weight to 110 pounds in eight months. This situation rocked him to the core. Today, Matt is healthy, energetic, and enthusiastic about life. He is now a transformation coach and a sought-after speaker who uses his experience and victories in his fight against cancer to help others transform their mind, body, and spirit, and to live their lives with purpose. I'd now like to welcome Matt Odie to our show. Welcome, Matt. Hi, James. Thank you for having me and uh, excited to be here today. Well, we are very excited to have you as well. I'm going to start off, Matt, by asking you, where were you born and raised? Yeah, so I was born in Buffalo, New York, but raised in Cleveland, Ohio. So I moved to Cleveland when I was about four years old. My dad just had a good opportunity and um, he took it and I've lived here ever since. So I've heard a lot of things about Cleveland throughout my life and a lot of them were negative. And Kelly and I visited Cleveland a few years ago and it is a wonderful city. It, It really is. We had such a good time. We've even talked about going back and visiting. So I think Cleveland got a a bad rap, just like New Jersey often gets a bad rap. And that's where I'm from. Yeah, I think it it comes down to, you know, it's who you know while you're there or just like going and visiting the city for yourself. Like you said, like a lot of people will say things before they ever even visit. And, um, you know, the past 10 years, our city has been completely rebuilt, like from top to bottom almost, you know, it's just been so many amazing things. And, uh, you know, you can credit like LeBron and, you know, our sports teams to that, but also, you know, we just, I feel like have an amazing city with hardworking people. And uh, I've always loved Cleveland. And I think exactly like you said, until you actually come and visit, don't knock it. Right. Now you mentioned LeBron. Are you a Cavaliers fan? I am a Cavs fan. It's kind of tough to be one right now. It's just, but I, I'm a fan. I am a hundred percent a fan. I will always root for them. Um, but they're, uh, they're on that, that down streak, just trying to rebuild their team right now. I think. Got it. Matt, what were you like as a kid growing up? What were some of the things you were interested in? Did you have hobbies, certain sports you like? Tell us a little bit about yourself when in your early years. Yeah, I, I definitely love sports. Sports has always been a huge part of my life. It's brought a lot of discipline into my life. It's brought a lot of drive, a lot of competition, which I think is uh, super important. You know, I basically dabbled in every sport you can think of, football, baseball, basketball. Um, I ran cross country. I ran track, uh, everything, man. But in my early, early years, I would say basketball and baseball were my two big sports. You know, my dad, we started a team when I was like a travel league team when I was probably eight years old and all the way up till probably 16, we only switched out like two different people on the team. And to this day, we've gone to probably seven out of the 12 kids weddings because they've gotten married. I mean, it's just how close we are as a family. So it's really cool. I have some of my best friends still on that baseball team. Um, so that was a big sport for me till I was probably in high school. And then I really transitioned to uh, cross country and track where, you know, I, I felt like it was a calling because, you know, I just, I was really good at it. And it was just something I really enjoyed. So I did that through high school. And then once I got to college, basically, I didn't want to start running 90 mile weeks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I transitioned into lifting and I said, I, instead of me being 130 pounds, let's just jump up to, you know, 175 and start building some muscle. And that was my true calling in life. And that's what I still do today is I, you know, help people through that area. 
So you really worked up to it. So you had a lot of stuff going on in your house with sports, and it was also part of your community and community of friends as well. 100%. So Matt, you mentioned about going to college. Can you tell us uh, where you went to school and what kind of interests did you have academically? Yeah, so I went to a small college called Ashland University, it has about 2000 undergrad students. Um, it's in between Ohio State University, which is the biggest in Ohio, and then like Cleveland. So basically, it's like right dead smack in the middle. And uh, for me, I did run cross country my first year there, um, decided to and track, decided to kind of stop that. And I focused on my major, which was uh, business management. So I didn't know my what I wanted for my major for probably a year and a half, I kind of went in undecided, just dabbling around, figuring out what it is. And I think that's important for a lot of people is it's like, you don't need to have life figured out at 18 years old, you know, go in and see what you enjoy. Do you like education? Do you like the health industry? Do you like business? What triggers you? So for me, my first two years was a lot of core classes, you know, math and science, all that stuff. I never really could get myself to enjoy it because it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do with my life. But as soon as I got into my junior and senior year, started getting into marketing, business management, entrepreneurial things, learning about, you know, how money works, stuff like that. I was so intrigued. You know, that's where, you know, I felt like, okay, this is, this is something I really enjoy and I, I want to kind of do for the rest of my life. That's so true. I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I know a lot of kids change majors at least one time, if not two or three times during their, you know, undergraduate work. I think, when you're going in at 18 years of age and you're expected to say, well, I'm going to major in this and I'm going to take four years and I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to do this and I'm going to go off into the working world and do that. We just, at 18, we just, I know I didn't have it figured out. I didn't know what I wanted to do or be or, or what have you. It was just like the next step in life I was taking. And I was kind of, I felt like I had blindfold on. I didn't really know what I yeah. wanted to do. Sometimes I think I still don't know what I want to do. Uh, don't we all? I feel like, you know, it's a never ending journey. Life will bring you to so many different destinations. You know, you just don't know exactly where yet, but just got to keep pushing along. I agree with you. Matt, in August of 2016, you received a devastating diagnosis of cancer. I wanted to ask you, right at the time that you received that diagnosis, or right before you received that diagnosis, what was your life like? What were you doing? Where were you at? What were your dreams? Yeah, I mean, I did have symptoms. I will say that, you know, I had a lot of back pain. I had a lot of, you know, difficult times walking and doing physical activities, things like that. But I was in kind of like the health industry. So I was a wellness director and my whole objective, you know, was helping people create healthy lifestyles. You know, with my life, you know, as I told you uh, with business management and marketing, I eventually maybe one day wanted to build my own gym or really start my own business with online coaching and helping others in that direction. I didn't exactly know what, but I knew that my life was predicated towards like, you know, being healthy and Really, I wanted to give back to that community and help people, whether it was, you know, build muscle, lose weight, create a healthy lifestyle. And that was really my objective before I was diagnosed with cancer. And how old were you in 2016 when you received the diagnosis? Yeah, so I was 24 years old when I received the diagnosis. Yeah. And what about your personal life? What was going on in your personal life at the time that you found out about this? Yeah, I had uh, just started dating my now fiance, Lauren. We were only dating for about two months. And it was very frustrating on both our ends because when we first started dating in the beginning of the summer, we'd go kayaking, we'd go hiking, we'd do all these fun activities. And then slowly but surely, my ego wouldn't go to, I wouldn't go to the hospital. I wouldn't go get myself checked up because I was just like so healthy, I thought at the time. And, it, you know, I was like, this will just magically somehow go away. And it never did. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And, um, you know, it, it really hindered our relationship because we weren't able to do a lot of the things that we enjoyed doing, you know, two, three months ago. So that was really challenging. And, you know, it, it was just kind of a, a battle between it. But you know, today, um, she still stuck around with me. So, <laughs> and she stuck with you through thick and thin, which we're going to find out as we go through this interview. 
So Matt, you mentioned that you were having some symptoms and you just weren't feeling well, but you figured you were in really good shape and it couldn't be that important, but it was limiting you in your activities. Can you tell us what eventually prompted you to go get checked out and what was the result of that? Yeah, good question. So I was over Lauren's house one day and I ended up puking up blood. Oh, uh, you know, I still being completely ignorant, um, kind of tried to shrug it off, but I had no choice, but I had to end up going to the hospital. They did a blood test on me. They found out I'd lost two thirds of the blood circulating in my body, which is equivalent to actually a gun wound shot. They gave me six bags of blood immediately rushed me into an emergency surgery that night because they thought it was an ulcer that was causing the bleeding. And, uh, the next morning I woke up and when I woke up, my doctor was, you know, in the room and he just had this blank stare in his eyes. And I knew that it was much more than an ulcer. And that's when he sat down with me and he stated, Matt, we, uh, we found an 11 centimeter tumor in your small intestine. We know it is cancerous but we don't know what type yet. And um, we have to send you today right over to the Cleveland Clinic from our local hospital that I was at. That right there was one of the most um, definitely shocking pieces of news I've ever heard in my life. So I can't imagine what was going through your mind at that time. It must have been, you know, you're, you're going from all these oh, wonderful plans and you know, about maybe going into business for yourself in the future. And you've just, you've just met somebody that's great. And to get that news, it must have just rocked you. Yeah, I would say, especially at our age, just like you said, you know, in the mid 20s, you're trying to just figure life out already. And to get this type of news, like it goes from trying to figure your life out to trying to basically, how do I survive? For me, uh, I thought that holding in my emotions in the moment would be the best thing. And I quickly realized that the longer I was holding in my emotions, the longer I was trying to be strong for other people, it was creating more anxiety. It was creating more PTSD. It was creating more mental struggles in my life than it was serving me. You know, eventually, you know, as a few days go by, um, Lauren comes and visits me at the Cleveland clinic. And that's when, you know, me and her just kind of broke down. And um, she told me she wasn't leaving. It was like a relief off of my shoulders. And I just broke down and just started sharing how I was feeling. And I think that's a huge thing for a lot of people, um, especially us men, is don't be afraid to share your emotions. Because at the end of the day, the more you hold on to them, the more baggage you're going to be putting onto your life. And you don't have to share it to the world, but sharing it to somebody you love and trust um, can make a massive difference in your life. Absolutely. So Matt, the doctor said that you knew something really bad was happening with your health. The doctor mentioned that he had to do some more tests. So what was the final diagnosis for what you had? Yeah. So when they got me to the Cleveland clinic, oh my gosh, they did so many different tests on me. I mean, left and right, I was getting tested, but what really actually triggered it was they did an ultrasound. And what the ultrasound found was that the cancer had originated in my testicle. And this is the weird part. So for most testicular cancer patients, you get a symptom in your testicle. For me, that was the weird part is I never had a symptom. I didn't have enlargement or anything like that. It had grown in my small intestine, but it had originated in that testicle. So that is where they found out that it originated there. And then as they did blood work, they found out that, so basically how they track your, um, cancer when it comes to testicular is they do it through different types of tumor markers and they can do it through your blood. And one of my markers, which was my AFP is supposed to be under five. So under five is your cancer free or you're fine. You're just normal. I was over 75,000 to put things in perspective. So I was off of their charts and it, my cancer had spread to all different parts of my body. And uh, that's when they finally diagnosed me with the highest stage of testicular cancer, which is um, my understanding, my oncologist says is stage three C. So it can be the same thing as four, but he says that's, that's what they diagnosed me with. So did they say, well, there's a chance you may not survive. Is there, mm. a, did they say anything along those lines? So the clinic is amazing. I will say this. The Cleveland clinic is absolutely amazing with communication. They're absolutely amazing with their treatment, all of that. So 
they knew that it was going to be a very tough battle. My oncologist came to me the first day and he's like, Hey, listen, man, like you're in for a tough battle, but he's like, I've dealt with thousands and thousands of testicular patients. And, um, I know you can get through this. So he gave me that encouragement, but he also told me, he's like, listen, you're one of the top 1% of like most difficult patients I've had to deal with. So this ain't going to be an easy battle, but it's a, it's one you can overcome. And I knew I had to put on my hard hat. It was go time. And that was my thing was listen, like straight focus on what do I need to do to better myself? That's all I could focus on. I couldn't focus on outside distractions. I couldn't let setbacks or, you know, potential, potential things dictate my emotions because it would just absolutely ruin me. So I had to stay focused and I had to stay strong using my support, my faith, and, um, you know, my discipline from my past. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I can only say that I do know what it's like to be told that you have cancer. I, I was diagnosed with cancer and I agree with you that having somebody that you can open up to and share your grief, sometimes your grief, your fears with is just so important. And my wife was that person for me, specifically. Yeah. And we need that. And, and I, I love that you say grief, because I want to make a point here. It is totally okay to grieve. It is okay to be angry. It is okay to be sad. It's okay to be um, whatever your emotions are. But you cannot live in that situation. There's a point in time where you have to tell yourself that I'm either becoming the victim of this situation at this point, and I need to get out of that and become the victor, victorious of the situation and push past it. And I'm not saying that's going to happen right away. So if it takes you days, if it takes you weeks, that's okay to grieve a little bit. It's like the famous saying, it's okay to not be okay at times. And that's totally fine. But if you are living in there and you are just looking for, it does sounds bad, but it, you're looking for that comfort or you're, you're looking for that pity. Like that's the point in time where you need to start taking action towards saying, Hey, listen, at the end of the day, I can have all the support. I can have everything I need in my life, but the only true person that's going to get me out of this situation is me, me and my faith. And that's what I realized was me and God at this point, that's all I could focus on. And yes, I knew I needed the support, but I had to make that change ultimately. Right. Well, thank you for that. Matt, I realize that hindsight is 2020, but I would imagine as you got this diagnosis, you started to think about all those symptoms that you were having, and um, that must have kind of hit you at that time, I bet. You know, that's why I want to tell people, you know, especially men out there, go get yourself checked once a year. Just go get yourself checked. Get some blood work and get yourself checked. Because at the end of the day, your health is the most important thing in your life. If you don't take control of your health, you're not gonna be able to do the things you want with the people you love and have the energy to do the things that is passionate to you in life. So for me, I wish I would have gotten checked sooner, but I can't, you know, hindsight's 2020. So uh, they put me on the five rounds of chemotherapy. BEP is bleomycin, the top of science is flat and very potent drugs. Lost my hair within a week and a half. You know, anybody, you know, it, it, all the symptoms, fatigue, um, you know, getting out of bad days. I couldn't, I literally could not get out of bad days. Um, having people feed me at times, you know, always taking nausea medicine because you don't know when you're going to get absolutely nauseous. And once that happens, it's a vicious cycle. So staying on top of it, I ended up losing my three-year-old puppy directly in the middle of chemotherapy who was diagnosed with cancer just about three months before me. So it was like losing a best friend to me. Anybody who's had a pet, I, I know you can feel it. And for me at three years old, it was talk about falling into a victim mindset. I fell into this why me mentality. I have this famous saying is everything in life happens for you, not to you. And I started looking at life as why is life happening to me? God, why is this happening to me? Why are you putting me through this challenge? Why am I losing somebody that feels my best friend? Started making excuses, started blaming God, started blaming other people. But if you can start looking at life as how is this happening for you? I know it's unfair. I know it's unexpected news, but how can you learn from this experience while you're still here? become a better version of yourself. And then ultimately, at some point in your life, use all those experiences, because this is where meaning comes in, to help other people. And I had to, it took a lot of faith, a lot of prayers, a lot of support, and me finally getting out of it. Remember, it's okay to grieve. I grieved for about five days. Didn't want to go to chemo, didn't want to do anything. But there was one day where I said, 
listen, I know I'm grieving, but I have to take action or I'm, I'm going to be next. Literally, I'm going to be next. So I, I got up off my bed one day and I just started walking and I, I didn't walk very far, but I started doing something. I started taking one small step a day to get me towards where I need to do, which was finishing chemotherapy at the time. And I started looking at life that's happening for me. So eventually I finished those five rounds and you know, it was kind of like accomplishing Mount Everest. I thought that, you know, I was finally done. Everything was going well. And little did I know this was the start of a very treacherous journey ahead of me. That was kind of my journey with chemotherapy. And I can share a really cool story of uh, right after too, with what my dad and, and Lauren did with me, if you want me to share that. Yeah, I'd love for you to share that. Yeah. So it was my birthday. So first thing, there was two events. So my birthday was three days before I finished chemo. And I decided to go to dinner with my parents and Lauren and stuff. And it was really cool. And uh, we were downtown. And then they said, hey, let's just go to, you know, this hotel. They always, they said they have really good dessert there. I was like, there's really good dessert at this place. They're like, no, no, no. But this place has really good dessert. I was like, all right, whatever. So I'm going there. I remember looking down at my phone and I see a Snapchat and my friend is like posting it. And he's going the same place as me. I'm like, Lauren, my friend's going to the same place. She's like, whoa, don't worry about it. Like, like she was like, Matt, we're almost there. She's like, we'll go see him when he gets there. Well, I go up to the elevator. It's like 20 floors up. We're on like kind of like the rooftop. I get up there and there's like probably close to 50 to 60 of my friends and family all surprising me for my birthday. So it was a really cool experience. And I didn't, I still didn't have a clue. None of it. I did no clue. So they did a surprise birthday for me. It was such a cool experience. And uh, it was really cool to get to see the love and support from so many friends that were there for me. You talk about letting other people in, you almost draw energy from the support, don't you? Oh my, feel I don't know what it was, but I didn't feel like I had cancer that day. Yeah. I was bald. I was finishing my last rounds. I was probably one of the weakest I'd been, but when I saw those, my friends, my energy level just shot right up. And tell me, were the desserts good? <laughs> I, I don't even think there was dessert there. It was like, it was like a bar with, I don't need, I didn't even have any dessert. It wasn't even just, they just needed to get me there. So I actually did have one drink that night, which I was like, you know what? It's my birthday. I'm going to have a drink. And you know what? Cancer is not going to take away any of that for me. So I had one drink and it was just really cool to, to see my friends for that time. So they may have brought like a cake or something, but I don't even remember. So, um, <laughs> but it was just a really cool, cool thing. So after that, my dad, to celebrate chemotherapy, he decided to host an event on Thanksgiving morning. So my birthday was November 18th, Thanksgiving, November 25th, or around that area. So I had just finished chemotherapy. And he said, okay, we're just going to get people, our, um, a lot of cities do this too. They host what's called a turkey drop. And it's basically a 5 and 10K race. Thousands, like I think we get like 7,000 people to come to this Cleveland one. Well, this time it's like 30 degrees like snow's drizzling down. And uh, I'm like, there's nobody that's going to show up. It's seven in the morning on Thanksgiving. And my, my dad said, you know, we're just going to host an event to celebrate your finishing a chemotherapy. Get there. No kidding. Over 400 people showed up Thanksgiving morning to show support for me. And the really cool part is, is my dad bought a ton of t-shirts and it's called Mustaches for Matt. So the, the event that we host was called Mustaches for Matt but we had 400 people show up. So what had happened was in the very beginning of my chemotherapy, I lost all my hair. As you can tell, I have blondish red hair. So it's very like, you can just use, it's very noticeable. So when I lost all of it, I had this dirty mustache that I just was like, this is all I got left on me. I'm keeping it. And all my <laughs> friends, of course, they were going to make fun of me. So they said, you know what, Matt, we're going to all grow mustaches with you. All my guy friends, all the dads. So all of my friends and all my, uh, all the dads grew mustaches throughout the whole rounds of chemotherapy for me. So we ended up calling the event mustaches for Matt. So the guys had their mustaches on girls wore fake mustaches. We had these cool mustaches for Matt t-shirts. I'm going to tell you right now, I probably didn't even know 200 of the 400 people. So it goes to show you that in life, you have so many more people. And, and a lot of those people were like, you don't even know how many people are praying for you outside of this, like out of the country, in the country, thousands apparently were praying for me and still were, you know, during this next chapter. And uh, I'm telling you, you don't even know how many people are there for you when you need that, but just don't be afraid to ask for help. Just don't be afraid. So it was a really cool event. The race organization 
which is Hermes, recognized us and got a ton of pictures. And they're like, they asked me, you know, what's it for? And it's, you know, I told them about cancer and literally the next two years after. So for three straight years in a row, we did an event there with, you know, hundreds of people that show up. We had different color shirts each year. And uh, the, the next two years, they actually did a shout out um, with me. And it was just such a cool experience. So I just had to share that. So I don't share too much, but I wanted to share that. So that is terrific. Knowing that there's that many people out there supporting you, even people who didn't know you personally. I love that. And then in times what we're having now where there's a lot of divisiveness, this type of thing just goes to show that there's a lot of good hearted people who really want to come alongside their fellow human beings and support them. And I love that story, Matt. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. You know, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I get done with all of that, go to my oncologist a couple of weeks later, sits down with me and he goes, Matt, we have good news and we have bad news. Good news. Your tumor has shrunk from 11 centimeters to three centimeters. I'm like, heck yeah. Like can't be that bad news. And he says, but your tumor is wrapped around what's called your inferior vena cava. Now your inferior vena cava is basically a central vein that goes from the bottom of your upper body to your heart. We're going to have to do a 12 hour surgery with four different surgeons involved to remove the tumor, to remove the rest of the cancer and whatever else is in your body that is like, you know, causing cancer. And I was like, okay, let's do this. So two weeks goes by. It was the longest two weeks of my life. Get the surgery. And so when going into the surgery is about 140 pounds. I was 185 pound personal trainer before this lost about 40 to 45 pounds going into the surgery, get out of the 12 hour surgery two days later. So they had me, you know, in the ICU incubated, things like that. I, I wake up two days later, all of a sudden I wake up and my stomach is just bloated, not just my stomach, but my whole body. I get on a scale and I'm weighing in at about almost 200 pounds. So what had happened was my body when they took out all of the cancer, they took out the tumor and everything, my body just started swelling up. And I believe it was a survival mechanism. My doctor didn't know why, my nurses didn't know why, but they, they said, hey, we have a draining tube in your stomach. The fluid should eventually drain. You should be okay. A week goes by, I'm out of the hospital. Another week goes by, I am you know, feeling like I'm making some progress, but I'm still just not feeling that great. Obviously, I just had a massive surgery from my left hip to my right hip where they had to open me up. And all of a sudden the draining just stops just like that. I'm in so much pain within an hour, I get rushed to the emergency room. They do a blood test on me and they're like, listen, he's in so much pain. We have no idea what's going on. So they rushed me in, they get me an ambulance. And right then and there, they had to drain seven liters of fluid out of my stomach, causing me to go into complete kidney and liver failure. I had a cone drilled inside of my head to monitor brain swelling. I had a catheter in my chest. I had a catheter in my neck because they thought I was going to be on dialysis the rest of my life. And I went into a two-week non-induced coma. My body went to what's called compartment syndrome, where it just completely shuts down. And a really strong story of faith was while I was in that coma, Lauren and my parents never left. They never left the ICU. They stayed there every day unless they had to go change or something, but we had a, a hotel in the hospital. My mom held three prayer services, local prayer services, where hundreds of people would go to it. And we had hundreds of people praying there. Apparently what they told me was thousands around the world. And Lauren every day would come up to me. She'd hold my hand and she'd just pray for healing. She'd pray God that I'd get healed, that I'd start to wake up. And I kid you not on the last prayer service, well, everybody was praying around the world in the church and Lauren was holding my hand was the moment I woke up from my coma. Wow. She felt my hands wiggling. She rushed over to the nurses. They didn't even believe her. They get that surgeon to come in. He comes rushing in. They see my eyes start to open a little bit and they knew that I was starting to wake up. And for me, it was God saying that this isn't the end of your journey. This is the beginning of something that I want to help you with. Yeah. I got more for you to do, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember anything about waking up that time? Did that remain in your memory? I remember the coma a little bit. I don't remember that part. No, I, it wasn't like, oh, I got to get up or do any, it was like super slow. Like I, I had jaundice as well, which is where your whole skin turns yellow. Cause uh, I, it's either your liver failing or your kidney failing. I forget which one it is, but I was like a banana and uh, I probably didn't know till about three or four days out of it, but 
I do remember certain things in my coma. So I remember seeing nurses and it was really weird because I think potentially when I was in my coma, I would like partially wake up and I'd recognize faces and then I'd like be back in a coma. I don't know what it was, but I recognized certain nurses. I remember right before, this is pretty crazy too, right before I was about to wake up. It's super weird. I know it, but it's dreams. It's like you're in a dream. I'm running from these nurses and all of a sudden I get into this room. I, I seriously remember this like clear as day. I get into this room and it's all the people I love, my friends, my family, Lauren, parents, and they're like cheering me on, literally clapping for me. And I was confused, but I remember them saying, okay, Matt, it's time to wake up. And I just, that's where, that's where, you know, I don't really remember the whole waking up part, but I can, it's so weird. I can actually remember that part of it. And some people, you'll hear stories, man, of people like, just had the craziest things when they're in comas, like that they can remember. And uh, that was one really powerful thing. Wow, Matt. I mean, you were, you were a sick boy. So now you've gone through all that chemo and then they had to go in and do this dramatic surgery and you go into a coma. So what, what happened next? Once you had woken up, what was the next step that the doctor oh, wanted boy. to do? Yeah. You think it's over and it's just beginning. So now a week later, I'm finally like making some progress. The breathing tube, they also had a breathing tube in my mouth, obviously, because I couldn't breathe on my own. So they take that out and they go to take out one of the catheters in my neck because I'm just starting to make small progress. So like, okay, you know, we'll take this one out. As they do so, I go into what's called an arrhythm a heartbeat. It's like a 0.001% chance. My heartbeat goes out of rhythm. I go into cardiac arrest. They have to do eight minutes of CPR on me and I fall into another one week coma. They induced me into it. So the other one was not induced and this one was induced. So they induced me into this one, um, but I was in it for an entire week. So I remember waking up a week later is then now Valentine's day. So I got my surgery January, like 7th. This is now like, you know, I had a week or two and then I was back in the hospital like mid January. And then now it's like February 14th and I'm just waking up now. So I've been in the ICU for close to a month now. And I go to try and like lift my hands up. Can't do it can't lift my feet up, can't lift anything. I was so weak. I realized that I had to relearn to live my entire life again. At this point in time, I'm already four surgeries in, by the way, because when they had to drain the fluid out of my stomach, it took a process. So I had my initial big surgery and then three additional surgeries to remove all that fluid. Couldn't have anything to eat, couldn't drink anything. It was all through liquid IV. And I just remember it took two weeks for nurses to get me from laying in my bed to taking my very first steps again. I had wires everywhere in my nose and in, in my body at places you don't want to know. Like I had them everywhere. So it was really challenging. It was the most difficult thing I had to do ever had to do again was learning to walk again. I eventually persevered and I got out of that ICU eventually after over a month at this point and three days in I'm making good progress. And they're like, okay, we're putting you into your final stages of physical therapy. And we're hoping to get you out of this, this hospital um, within a couple of days. And as they're wheeling me, not in a wheelchair, as they're wheeling me in my bed, I kid you not, my stitches burst open. They have to rush me into a fifth major surgery. And they had to do what's called an open wound surgery on me. Oh, they couldn't man. close my skin back up. So I had to leave a football size mesh. They had to take out all of my abdominals. I had no abdominals left. They had to put a football size mesh on my stomach. And it took a full year for that to even heal. So um, as you guess, I went right back to that ICU room. And I want to talk about rock bottom, because if I wasn't in rock bottom, any of those times, I was for sure in rock bottom now, mentally, emotionally, physically. And uh, I just remember waking up and uh, this was scary because for two days, my hands were tied to the back. They didn't want me touching my wound on accident. I had a breathing tube in my mouth. And for two days, they didn't know that I was healthy enough to be conscious, to be able to talk. But for two days, I was. I knew exactly what was going on. So I'd have a breathing tube in my mouth, couldn't say a word to the nurses, couldn't get their attention. And um, I had to pray. And I remember praying to God and I said, I have two options here. I can either give up on my life right now. I fought as hard as I could. Or I'm in the lowest point of my life. And guess what? Only place I can go is up. And when they finally got my hands released, got the breathing tube out, I walked further that day, 
flock further than I had ever done previous to the ICU, previous to the past recovery rooms. And uh, I was out of the ICU in like two and a half days and finally into my final stages of physical therapy. Long story short, I ended up being in the ICU for over 40 days. I ended up being in the clinic for over 50, I think it was like 55 days or something like that. But I was released on March 17th of 2017 exactly one year from when I met Lauren and she was literally like an angel sent down for me. I know for a fact, God brought us together for partially that part of our life. You know, my question to you is for anybody watching, you know, and James, I already know who yours is, is, is who is that person in your life when you know, when everything seems lost, you have nowhere to go yet. You still have that support from that one person. That person will be there for you no matter what. And a lot of the times, and I can attest to this, we can take that person for granted. If you know who that person is, give them a call. Or if you see them in person, tell them just one or two things of what they've done for you in your life and how much you appreciate it, you know, that they've done for you. Because not only is it going to make their day better, it's going to make your day better as well. And I think it's just, we don't, you know, we don't recognize them enough. And we, you know, so I sometimes need to take a step back when I feel like me and Lauren may be getting into a small argument and and we can really put things into perspective. And I can say for everything she's done for me, and I'm going to act this way towards her. And instantly it'll allow me to be more empathetic or be more apologetic or try to understand where she's coming from. I think that can help in a relationship. So, yeah, so that's my story. Um, And when I got out of the hospital, I was 110 pounds and I wasn't rainbows and butterflies. I can tell you that it was a grueling recovery process. That's an incredible story. And just to, to comment on what you were just finishing talking about, I agree hundred percent about, for instance, in your situation, you were, you said you hit rock bottom and uh, God was there for you. And Lauren was there. obviously your parents were too in a great community, but she was there right alongside of you. It had been, uh, it was St. Patrick's day. It's like that, that's the day, right? It's our day. Yeah. There. And when you have somebody in your life who will be there with you at the rock bottom, you think a lot less about impressing a lot of other people or trying to keep up with the Joneses, as they say, or, uh, you know, comparing yourselves to others when, you know, you got somebody in in your corner who has seen you and been with you all through the hardest, most difficult times. It gives you a peace in your heart. And that's a great message. I am just astounded by the physical and really emotional pounding that you took and how even with all the support that you had from Lauren and from your family and your friends, it, there was still, as you said, it comes down to you, uh, you know, you choosing to reach out to God and you choosing to lean into people who are close to you. Uh, that was something that was your part to do in it. Right. And yeah. that's important too. And yeah. I don't think I would have been able to, without those people in my life, you know, that that's like from my mother being so faith-based, you know, my father giving me the discipline, Lauren giving me peace when I feel anxious and um, having friends and family that were just, I know are there for me. So it, all the puzzles kind of come together, you know, but you have to be willing to ask for that help and you have to be willing to um, say, Hey, listen, like I cannot fight this battle by myself, you know, God or whatever you, anybody listening believes in, you know, for me, it is God that when you go off on an adventure or a challenging moment in your life, it is going to feel extremely lonely because at the end of the day, even though I had that support, unless somebody actually goes through it and knows exactly what it's like to be saying you have cancer, not your friend, not your daughter, not even, you have cancer, then, you know, it's, it's really hard to relate. And um, at the end of the day, you know, I also think that being around people who um, have gone through similar situations as you and being able to talk with them can really help, especially those that are further along than you and are now taking care of themselves. You know, sometimes it's good to talk to those people so they can give you some advice. Agreed. Agreed. Now, Matt, let's go from now this uh, emerging from the setbacks and the chemo and the surgeries and everything like that. And 
you've sort of come out of the other end of the tunnel. How did that experience, what you went through, how did that impact who you are today and what you're doing today in your personal life, your faith life and your business? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So it took me two years, no joke, literally two years to recover myself mentally, emotionally, and physically. And when I first got out of the hospital, um, without the nurses and doctors constantly pushing me for a good couple of weeks, I, I once again went to excuse mode, went to the victim uh, mentality. And I was literally back in the hospital. I don't share this part either often um, too much either. I was back in the hospital two weeks, two to three weeks later with a standing heart rate of over 150 beats a minute. My blood pressure was through the roof. My temperature was 104 degrees. And it was simply because I was not taking care of myself because I was weak. I was tired. I, I let the situation control me. And when I got back out, me and Lauren had probably the most um, important discussion of my life. And it came to the conclusion of, if I don't start taking action today towards bettering myself, I will most likely not be here next month. And that was the true, honest, true answer. So I had no option. I had no option. And what I did was I said, what is one thing I call it winning the day? What is one small task that I can complete today to getting me to my big result? My big result was healing myself and being able to be independent. And it started off with me going into my parents' home gym, picking up a five pound dumbbell and doing bicep curls that day. You know what I did the next day? The same thing. And then you know what I did after that? I would put lawn chairs, no joke. I would put lawn chairs from one end of my driveway to the other. And I would walk to that lawn chair and I'd sit down for, I don't know, a minute or two. And then I'd walk back 25 meters. That's it. You know what I did the next day? I'd move it a tad bit further, a tad bit further. This is the, this is the power of compound effect, guys. When you are willing to win the day, and what I mean by that is when you win five out of the seven days, that means you've won the week. When you can win three out of those four weeks, you've won the month. When you can win six or seven of those months, you are a totally different person by a year from now. Totally different person because you took action towards something that is going to be help you become a better version of yourself. So for the first two years, it was all about me. And it's my little famous saying is in order to be selfless in life, you must be selfish first because you cannot go out and help you. How do you expect to change the world when you can't change yourself first? And I'm not saying you have to just always be focusing on yourself, but there's a point in time where you need to focus on yourself, get the lessons, get the experience, and then say, okay, all of this, how can I use to help other people? And that's what was next in two years. So then I said, okay, what's next? Where's my, I went through all of this and God, I know you have a plan for me. Like anybody who goes through something challenging, anything challenging in your life, you know that there's a purpose behind it, a meaning behind it. So what I did, this is literally what I did. Went on YouTube, started looking at motivational people. You know, I started with like the classic, like Tony Robbins and things like that. And then all of a sudden I came across this podcast guy, his name was Ed Milet. He's an entrepreneur, but he's also very motivational as well. And the tagline was broke to 400 million. Like I said before, I love money, but like, it's not like the happenings, but it caught my attention. Watch the video, almost nothing about the money, nothing, everything to do about the challenges he had to go through to get to where he is today. And I said, Whoa, if this dude's sharing all this stuff and he's impacting the world like that, I need to be sharing my story and doing the same thing. So I started to, this is what I did. I started to look at him. I got into his community. So this is what you do. You find people that you are attracted to, that you feel a connection with, and you look at their community. Usually they're influencers. So start joining hashtags on Instagram. Start joining people who are following him, maybe Facebook groups that they have, or go on social media, just start getting into the community. And then all of a sudden I got into a business mastermind. He had a, the first year doing it. It was crazy. He did it with this guy named Andy Purcell, another really great motivational guy. Joined the group, about 600 people in it. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing in here. I'm not a business owner yet. I don't know what the heck is going on, but I knew God put this in my mind for a reason. And you know what he did? He put it in my heart. So I always tell people, when you get something right in here, you get that gut feeling, that's God putting it in there for you. Don't ignore it. So I, I took that risk. I took the financial risk. My parents were, this is where 
My parents didn't believe in me. Warren was like the only one that was like, okay, I believe in you. I don't know how, but I just do. But nobody else was, they're all like, you're crazy, but whatever. So I did it anyways, you know? So I get into the group and all of a sudden I start just sharing my story. I'm definitely afraid to share this story, but people are asking me, they're like, hey, why are you in this group? Blah, blah, blah. And as I'm sharing my story, like people's jaws are just like, are you a speaker? Like, are you speaking yet? Are you coaching people? What are you doing? I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing in here. And they're like, well, here's what you need to do. So they started giving me direction. And this is my best advice. If you want to go somewhere in life, somewhere big, you have this big, massive, grand vision. You need to, two different things, either find somebody who's already done what you want to do and start figuring out how they got to it. Or second, find people who are going to help motivate you and guide you along the way as you both are doing this journey together. And that's what I had to do. I surrounded myself with entrepreneurs, got the courage to share my story, started getting on stages, started sharing my story. Then of course, COVID hit. So that took like, I was like, okay, well, God, how is this happening for, you know, not just me, but for everybody. So then I started saying, okay, I'm going to get a podcast. I'm going to get doing online speaking. And then I started monetizing and into coaching. And I said, how, what is something that I can do? What is something meaningful that I went through? And I, for two years, I had to rebuild my life back up. So I was like, who right now has gone through it and didn't even have to be a cancer survivor. I was just like, who went through a traumatic experience in their life that knows that they want something more meaningful in their life. So they're ready to take an actionable step. They're not just looking for pity. They're not in that grieving period. They're ready to take action. And I started coaching people, helping them find, you know, first heal themselves mentally, emotionally, and physically, and then finding their purpose and their path in life by using their story, by using their message which I think is our greatest gift is our story is our greatest gift because nobody in the entire world has our story, but us. So using your story to uniquely impact people in a way that's meaningful to you. And that has been uh, my life mission now is getting on incredible podcasts, such as your shames. I'm getting on stages. Now I got to speak in Vegas not too long ago for a testicular cancer event. Now really pushing my coaching again. I took a little bit of time off and I built a Facebook group back in October and it was for just cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers. Anybody impacted by cancer was deathly afraid to start it. Deathly afraid because I was, I was like, am I going to be the leader people need? What if people started like, you know, not um, like they just don't collaborate well with each other. All these excuses. And that's once again, where people help push me to saying, listen, Matt, just do it. Take imperfect action. You're going to fail along the way. Today, we have close to 5,000 members in the group. Hasn't even been a year. And it is probably the most loving and supporting group I've ever been a part of. It is a family. So um, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you have a dream, if you have something, I know it's scary, but on the other end of fear and uncertainty is your biggest breakthroughs. So that's been my life. And uh, Oh, this is terrific. The name of our podcast is Your History, Your Story, right? Yeah. So you've got a story and your story resonates with people, not just people who've gone through cancer, but as you say, that, you know, if you've got any kind of traumatic uh, experience in your life or a difficult period in your life, and uh, sometimes you think there's no hope or it's never going to get better, but really giving people that hope and seeing what you went through and then offering these forums for people to encourage and support each other, to use it like you are to support each other and to use your story to really encourage others to rebuild their lives, to lean into your faith, to lean into people who matter and are close to you is wonderful. And it's just been a very inspirational story. So Matt, how can people learn more about you and the work you're doing? Absolutely. So if you want to join my Facebook group, it's called cancer survivor slash patient taking back your life from cancer. And um, if you just follow me on Facebook, which is just Matt Odie, um, you can uh, send me a request, just send me a direct message and ask me to join the group and I'll be happy to get you into it. Or you can go to my speaking website, which is Matt Odie, M-A-T-T-O-D-E speaks.com. And it has all of my social media, um, it has my Facebook, my Instagram, uh, my LinkedIn, and my YouTube channel on there. You can click on those. And if you want to connect with me through there, um, or if you're looking for a speaker, there's a section in there where you can um, just, all you have to do is fill in like two or three things and it'll go directly to my email and we can connect through there. Those are the best ways to, to reach me. That's terrific. What kind of goals or dreams do you have for the future? Yeah, um, my big goal, you know, in life, I would say, you know, my biggest thing that I want to accomplish down the road, maybe it's 10, 15 years, which I get very emotional about is 
I want to start a foundation that helps families financially whose young adults have been impacted by cancer. And the reason is, is because, of course, I was a young adult going through cancer, but I've seen where the financial part can be just as much of a burden as it is their own kid going through cancer. And that right there, I never want to see. Again, I want to build such a big foundation in my life. I want to first build a company up where I can build so much capital that I can use it to create this foundation where I take all the pressure off of families financially so they can put their time, energy, and attention towards what really matters in life. And that is taking care of their child who has gone through cancer. So that is no doubt my biggest, I think what I want to accomplish or my biggest dream in life is to build a foundation like that. I know it's going to take a lot of time and effort to acquire money and uh, build a, 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 my own business to first. And, you know, I'm sure I'll get help along the way too, but that right there, helping um, families financially, that's what it's about for me. It's all about taking care of people who've gone through traumatic experiences, but I think I'm going to do it in such a unique way where I build like retreats. I see myself building retreats where I can get on like celebrities that are like have a same direction as me get on organizations that have the same direction and just build this massive collaboration where we build one of the coolest events ever and it's it's something that changes the world um i dream big i i always tell people i say listen go shoot for the moon and if you don't reach it you land near the stars that's how i live my life that is a great goal you know, you look terrific. You look fantastic. You obviously you're taking really good care of yourself, doing what you have to do there. And you're a young man with uh, years ahead of you. But I want to ask you this question. Yeah. What do you want your legacy to be, Matt? I want, that's a great question. If I had to say what my legacy would be is I want people to know me as a person more giving than taking and a person that gives people hope. I want to give people hope. And I have a really cool acronym with hope too. And that is help one person every day. And I don't ever want anybody to underestimate the power of you just being able to help one person. And um, what I mean by that is giving value to one person will ultimately allow their knowledge to shed to other people. And as you help 10 people, you can ultimately help 100. So I want to help, you know, 1,000 people that ultimately help 100,000 people. You know, my end goal in life is I want to help 100,000 people that ultimately help tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of people. You just don't know the power of helping one person and what they can share. You've given them to others as well. So I want to be the person who people look at is who's given hope and gives more than he's ever asked to receive. Because I truly believe at the end of the day, abundance, fulfillment, and happiness comes from giving back to other people. Matt, I want to really thank you for being a guest on our show. Your story is so inspirational. I love what you're doing. And I love what you're planning to do as well. And I'm sure that our listeners have also really gotten something out of what you have to say. And uh, the strength and the courage and the faith that you have displayed to get through what you had to get through. And then the fact that you want to reach out and help other people to do the same thing is just wonderful. And I'm sure God has many great things ahead for you. So again, I want to thank you for being a guest on our show. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me tonight. Have a great day. Bye, James. Bye-bye. So, for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.